Hey everybody, what's up? I'm Zach Dunham. I'm here with uh, Bantam Tools, and I'm joined today by Ben Light. Hi hey, everybody. Um, we're we're doing we're back here with engineering from home. We took the last two weeks off, and um, uh, I'm I'm excited to to get this going again. So um, if you're just joining us for the first time, um, we started doing this. Uh, uh, I guess almost two months ago, it was right around when we went into lockdown. And um, it was just a really great way to reconnect with people in our community, people who are uh, actively using CNC machines or digital fabrication equipment. And then also people um, like Ben, who are educators. Um, and uh, really as a nice way for everybody to share their experience in, in what it is that they're doing in the world of making and engineering. Sometimes it's engineering from home. Sometimes it's hanging out from home. Um, and today, I think it, this is great because we're going to be able to talk a little bit about some very, just just definitely uh, some straight up engineering from home that Ben has been doing on, um, I think it's a personal project. Yeah. Um, um, and we're also going to dive into talking a little bit about uh, distance learning again. And um, so for any of you educators uh, joining us today, uh, this one's this one's for you again, and Ben. Now you're like a regular on. Yeah, I know. Is your your second time around with us? It's good to be back. It's good to be back. <laughs> um, well, k j jump right in. Um, okay. we, you know, we we're super excited to talk to you today to get some knowledge on uh, this clock project that you've been working on specifically, and yeah. to share the world of flexures with us and yes. what they are. So. Give us, a, give us an overview. Sure. Uh, like everyone else, I've been, uh, uh, you know, stuck at home. Um, and I typically am in New York, but my family and I, we, we kind of beat it to Pennsylvania into the Poconos. So I don't have my shop, my tools. And I took sort of like the bare minimum with me and, and took off. Uh, one thing was, was a Bantam mill. So luckily, um, and, uh, you know, it's been it's been fun working on projects that have sort of been on the back burner for a while. Um, and uh, the clock I uh, project we, we were talking about, uh, I am in a club called Clock Club uh, with uh, a few colleagues. Uh, two of them, uh, Tom Ago and Jeff Federson, who uh, are actually I think holding a Clock Club meeting without me right now. Um, it started as just nerding out over time and mechanisms and, and clocks that we love. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of come at it from very different angles. Uh, mine is very, I like the mechanical clockworkness uh, of it. And, um, and it's really just a, a group that gets together to kind of show off and kind of hold each other accountable and just come up with crazy ideas and get feedback and it really just, you know, very casual, but um, we all just nerd out and have the time with the projects we're working on. So, uh, um, well, I'll get, I'll get right into it. Here, yeah. here is the here is the project I've been working on. Um, uh, first, I'll just describe what it. Well, I'll, I'll describe what it is first before it's showing its function. Um, it's a uh, little pine wooden uh, backing uh, that's holding a bunch of Delrin pieces and a typical clock mechanism that you'd find in just about any battery powered clock, uh, analog clock. And everything was made on the Bantam except for the hands and the clock mechanism. Um, and there are uh, a few pieces going on here, um, but everything that's white is a type of plastic called Delrin that's very flexible, strong, um, and has sort of a built-in lubricant to it, so it's great for mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had this idea that I, I hate daylight savings because I have a lot of analog clocks that all have to, have to get behind them and turn them and fiddle with them. And uh, there should just be an easy way. Like digital what clocks should have a button, an on and off daylight savings. They don't, they should. Uh, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was an analog one? And the way this works is you fall back, <laughs> and spring forward. And I thought this was really clever. And I thought, oh my God, I can't believe no one's ever made a face moving. Uh, so then I was just talking with you before, I discovered while making it that it's not really an hour back and an hour forward. It's 55 minutes back and 65 minutes forward or <laughs> vice versa. So yes, it's, it's 
one o'clock. Now it's two o five. You know, so it's it doesn't quite work. But um, but the uh, but it was fun to make. And actually, the the part that is, I don't know if we can really see this. Uh, yeah, the part that's really, really interesting is is this guy right here. Um, in fact, I, I built a my initial mock up of the mechanism. Uh, where it's just the two pieces that are moving. Um, and this is what uh, is called uh, a flexure. This, this two-part piece, there's one that's sort of springy and has these two little indents here and here. And then the disc has a little dimple that fits into them. So it's compressing that, that curved part and it snaps in and it snaps it in. Out. Yep. And it has that really satisfying, it kind of goes home, right? Um, I've heard it called a detente. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. I've heard it just like good knob feel. You know, there's, a, there's like, there's, that's like that good, like clicking, right? And um, and it's it's one of those things that when you see the mechanism in front of you, you're like, oh yeah, it's obvious. But from a, how did you, how do you start with it? it um, it's it's really it feels very staring at a uh, a blank page for me. Um, there are a few mechanisms that I think people get right away. Uh, gears they understand, they understand cams yeah. right away. Then you go to linkages, and linkages get really complicated really quickly. What's a linkage? And linkage, right? I should explain. A linkage are stiff rods on pivot points and they're connected and you'll often hear of something called a three bar linkage. It's very hard to animate with my hands, but they basically ha are anchored in places and pivot in places. Right. Now and of, there, there are lots of um, uh, people have done really good uh, animations of these. There's, there's right. tons of, yeah. So think of like the most complicated are with the strong beasts, those giant wing powered, um, I'm forgetting the artist's name, but they're these crazy linkage movements and, or it could just be like kind of like a, a train uh, mechanism where it's uh, a wheel pushing a link, mm -hmm. pulling a link. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's, it can be very simple. Or it can get super complicated and the, there's no like easy entry. It just gets hard right away. And designing for a specific movement is really difficult. And I kind of not put these up in the same category where you know what you want, but you have no idea how to get there. So you That's do, what I was going to ask. Yeah. You know, there's the, yeah. So, so how do you go from, I want to, I want a, I almost said jump hour again. How do I, yeah. how do, how do I have the daylight? I want to have a daylight savings clock. It's going to so, have something like this. Yeah. So it's easy. Exist. Right. The easy part is saying, well, I, I need to move an hour, which is 30 degrees. And okay. So it has a start and a stop at zero and 30. But, and it could just have two walls, you know, it could just hit goalposts and being being. Um, but I want it to land there and I want you to know when it's, when it's in place. And that's really what the flexure is doing. It's sort mm -hmm. of snapping in at just the right kind of snap and snapping out with just enough force. And that's the difficult part to, to make. Um, I was lucky enough to rip off uh, a designer uh, who goes by the name of Amy is making stuff on Instagram. I wish I knew her last name. It's Amy. I, I don't know if she's hiding her last name on purpose or, or what, but I, I want to give her full credit. Um, I'm borrowing heavily from her design. Here, I'll drop uh, this into the chat. Yeah. Here we go. Really right, cool me. stuff. Yeah, she's done some great uh, designs, and she's been pretty uh, um, generous by posting them in GitHub too. Um, so I pulled one I liked and kind of re-modified uh, it a little bit, mm -hmm. and um, and then it was kind of like knowing what's the material I'm going to make it out of, what's the you know process. So obviously, I was going to mill it. Um, I had Delrin, so mm -hmm. um, you know. Thickness of material means a lot. Uh, and How is that playing into it? Because that's what I was going to ask: is like when you're when you downloaded that first initial file and you're starting to tweak it from GitHub. Yeah. What are you? What are the levers that you're pulling? And what are they supposed to do? So I didn't change the basic geometry too much. Um, I changed the the goalposts and I changed what my handle looked like. But the mm -hmm. flexure part that's the once again, the, Two, this sorry. part, right? Like yep. that, that I didn't really touch except moving where these two parts are. They were here and here, right? So I just okay. kind of moved that. But I didn't want to 
clip it off here because it wouldn't have as much spring. Um, so right. the geometry really affects its tension and, you know, there, so it's not only geometry, it's material, it's tolerance, it's material thickness, it's, mm -hmm. you know, how rough are the edges. Um, so it, it quickly goes into an area where you can't really design for it virtually, right? Like you can draw it and you can probably do some CAD models that can give you certain flexibility, but you know, if you file it better, or if it's, you know, a quarter inch thick or an eighth inch thick, Delrin, it, it changes. And that feel is, is something you have to experience, I think. So this is, this is a project that basically champions digital fabrication tools. It's, Absolutely. It's a, a yeah. Multi, many prototypes to get yeah. to the right knob feel kind of the, thing. The crazy thing is this was the first and only one I made, but I was standing on the shoulders of giants here. So um, it, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, I'm sure she made a ton to get that right satisfying click. And, um, and you know, even how long the lever is and how much, uh, you know, um, torque you can pull on it, it, it really, it all depends. So um, right. it's a spring, really. It's an internal spring that, you know, Getting the right springiness is is not is not trivial and not something that you just you know oh it's got to be seven and you know that's what it is uh, it, it's it's something you have to experience I think gotcha yeah how would you um, so where should people go to start learning about other types of flexures and and what are the other types of flexures I guess I should ask uh, so that I'm gonna get all the names wrong but. Um, the, so Fletcher's is the umbrella of yep. these. Um, basically, think of them as flexible parts built into the piece in a, as a whole. So it's kind of perfect for CNC uh, cutting. Mm -hmm. um, so you can remove material and, uh, and like leave the bit that's the spring. Mm -hmm. And if it's the right type of material, it'll act like a spring. So uh, it's really the different types of geometry and the numbers of contact with the other moving parts um okay. and i'm not going to embarrass myself by uh naming them because i don't remember them but okay. um if you look up flexures uh it, it gives you a few basics and then it gets kind of like there's not a lot of specifics uh but if you do a quick google you'll you'll get the basics but not really get a lot of um information uh but there are a lot of engineers and designers out there who do. Um, and the two big ones that I found were uh, Amy's making stuff. And BYU has a department called Compliant Mechanisms. Uh, okay. I, think I, I think I sent you that link. Yeah, and that they are super generous with their files. They, a lot of 3D prints, a lot of laser cut, a lot of milled parts, um, a lot of, they're, I guess technically they're not all flexures, but um, you'll see some interesting ones that, you know, are these kind of look like four bar linkages, kind of look like these crazy motion uh, uh, mechanisms, but they're all one part, they're all one piece. And you're getting all of this movement with no fasteners, with no assembly. Um, it's sort of like out of, off the mill or off the 3D printer, it functions, it has, it's, it's, kinetics and its mechanism already built into it. And it's harder to, to design, but it's easier to produce and use and assemble down the line. So uh, it's a hard one uh, mechanism, but uh, it, it pays off in, in repairability. It doesn't break down as much uh, hmm. and, and you don't disassemble it. Are you thinking you would teach some of this stuff at at NYU? I'm, I'm thinking of definitely incorporating it. I I, uh, I showed the BYU uh, uh, stuff to my class this semester while uh, we were on while we were remote, um, mainly because you know half of the semester was thrown out, uh, mm -hmm. and we kind of had to we kind of had to like. On, on the fly create a half a semester of digital fabrication with with no hands-on touching of tools uh so that was so i was i was starving for content to, to pass along uh, and and just to, to to jump in here on this because mm -hmm. i didn't give you a proper in introduction um mm -hmm. And we didn't actually mention this. So for people who have joined previous engineering from home live streams, they'll know you have been like the professor from from NYU. But yeah. um, what do you teach at NYU? Let me let me see so, you up there. 
I teach, thank you. I teach at a program at NYU called ITP, Interactive Telecommunications Program. And it's a, I usually describe it as an art school for technologists and a technology school for artists. Um, and it's, it's art and technology and every, you know, part of the, that Venn diagram can touch. Um, so typical projects are VR projects, creative coding, uh, digital fabrication, um, product design, you know, UI, UX design, crazy art, music, instruments, video games, like they all kind of like file under this. And um, I went to the program as a student and, and I teach there now, but I teach uh, fabrication primarily. And often engineering and design, uh, product design. So they, they all kind of, we give you just enough, enough information in all of those areas to make you hungry for more and to do it and then you graduate and then uh, um, but uh, this semester i was teaching a, a class called subtraction that is half digital fabrication so cncs um with three axis four axis uh, what else do we do i'm trying to remember the, the regular year so we we uh, we started with other, yeah I know um, we start with the bantam actually um, so we, we kind of grow in size and in axes as we go in the digital realm and then we also teach uh, hand router wood lathe and metal lathe and how uh, how they can all work together on a project how it can be you know, one machine only you know, there's a right tool for the job right material and mm -hmm. and then there's a little bit of CAD as well so. Um, but just enough to get through the process. So, and that's that's what the class, as far as I'm concerned, is about. It's learning the the process of CAD, CAM, CNC, uh, mm -hmm. and that and that crazy. It's not a it's not a loop. It's just like back and forth, back and forth prototyping. Yep. And once you realize that and know how to jump into it, uh, my work is done. And then you can do whatever you want to actually design. Uh, but learning what machines can do and the material can do and the CAD can do and not getting hung up on. Yeah. 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 Um, and then also doing the manual uh, removal of material so that you understand uh, um, what, right. uh, what does a router actually do that you feel in your hands? Yeah. What is, yeah. So. That, that, that was the thing that really stuck with me when I visited you um, in the old NYU space. And you explained that of like, yeah, well, we have people start with a handheld wood router because yeah. then you know what chatter feels like and I have this wonderful image in my mind of yeah. someone who's never held a router before and just shaking yeah. Yeah. wildly. And, and it's really, it's a great, um, yeah, the the analog world, right, lets us be better. Um, yeah, yeah. So, it, 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 yeah, in, in fact, companions. yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of students make on the CNC jigs for the hand router so that they have tools that they could take with them. You know, when you leave, you don't have probably don't have a big CNC, but you could get a router and you could do all these fancy jigs and things if you do it now, and then you can leave with all of that that, uh, that That's stuff clever. in your back pocket. Yeah. So okay, to to segue into the how do you teach in the time of COVID uh, yeah. portion of today's live stream. So you've been <laughs> teaching this class that, as you're you're describing, is obviously very very hands on. People have yeah. access to tools. Now everyone is remote. What yeah. did you do eight weeks ago? How did you pivot? Yeah. Um, well, there was, there was a week of, we had spring break. Uh, the pivot happened uh, with, with two, two weeks to figure it out. And at that point, we had got as far as three axis scene seeing 2D uh, files. So pockets and con contour cuts, the end. That's all we got. Okay. And so... Uh, you know, the, the obvious idea was, well, it becomes a CAD class and that's all it'll be. And it'll be, you know, whenever we come back, we'll take this 3D model and drop it in or we'll do this or we'll learn Fusion and we'll do all the CAM and kind of get you up to the starting line and then like build up all of this stuff. I, I didn't want to do that desperately because um, I think if you're new to CAD, hell, if you're really good at CAD, CAD lies to you very easily. Uh, you think you've made this thing that will work because it looks great or it fits or, you know. Right. Um, and, and the computer, it goes together just it's perfect. It's perfect. The tolerance is perfect. You know, and so 
it, it'll just lie to you. And um, it's, it's, and I agree, I, someone once said that to me, I think it's a professor I had, it's like, oh, CAD just lies. So like, don't, you know, mm-hmm. get, get off of CAD as soon as possible. And that's sort of been my philosophy. And um, so I, I desperately didn't want to do that. And I can't think of there's anything more boring than watching someone else draw something that you can't pause and rewind. Uh, YouTube is a better teacher of CAD almost always other than I'm stuck. Tell me what the answer is right now. Sure. Um, so we did a lot of that for homework, but um, what we ended up doing uh, is we got everyone in the class, a, uh, a cameo silhouette vinyl cutter, you know, real standard. I think it's typically for, for paper craft and scrapbooking and, you know, mm-hmm. a real basic machine. Um, it's a, uh, little drag knife, a tiny, tiny little exacto knife that goes Mm -hmm. back and forth and up and down and feeds the paper. So it has X, Y, and Z. They're just incredibly, you know, the Z is tiny. And, um, I'm looking this up. Yeah. Cameo craft vinyl cutters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're great. They're great. They cut paper, they cut, uh, thin plastic, they can cut some thin mat board. Um, and they're all, they supply like all crazy stuff. So there's sticker back, there's vinyl, or uh, there's matte, there's shiny, there's, you know, glow in the dark. And so for paper cutting, it's great, but it's a tough thing to swallow for a student that came ready to mill aluminum and plastic <laughs> and like make chips. Here, and like, vinyl cutter. Here, here's, a, here's a roll of, you know, sticky vinyl, make some stickers. Um, but it was sort of, uh, I, I, I think you said uh, your colleague Goalie called it the Chromebook of Digifab, and yes, it kind of was it, it for us anyway. Um, <laughs> and it was it was we got it in just in time. Um, in fact, one student was delayed because they waited a day or they didn't see an email and they gave me their home address later, and everyone got their uh, cutter on the the same day except for this one student it took like another week and a half. Because that was that tipping point of, of delivery. Sure, yeah. sure. So, so how do you? Okay, so what was your secret recipe to make the vinyl cutter enticing inter- yeah. and interesting when people have been designing these beautiful three D objects in Fusion, yeah. saying it goes together perfectly, and I can't yeah. wait to get onto the wood router. And then you say, "Here's this vinyl cutter. Welcome yeah. to the world of two D." Right. Well, um, so the first week was 2D. Um, it was, yeah. you know, go through these, basically you're making stickers or you're making like card stuff. Uh, can you program this thing with G code or how does it? So it's not G code. Um, but one student, uh, was, was going down the, that rabbit hole and was just like, I'm going to ch- talk directly to it. And <laughs> he found a hacker space in Germany that there, there is a, it's not G code. It's printer. I wasn't familiar with it. I don't remember what is up top of my head, but it wasn't, I was hoping it was G code. That would have been amazing. Um, okay. But it was uh, a little known language, uh, but a lot of these, these vinyl printers all are based on. Um, but the silhouette's a pretty closed black box for, for that kind of hacking. Okay. Um, but I had high hopes when I saw that, like, oh, this is gonna be great. But it, it was it was a little clunky. Um, if I and so you feed it uh, like a vector graphic. Yep, uh, uh, you can get plugins for Illustrator, or Inkscape, or you can use their their software. But um, I think it loved DXF files primarily, but um, just a, a vector graphic file, and you could do a lot of interesting things. Like it's a it's a full cut. It's a different depth of cut. It's a dashed score. Um, it's, uh, they have different, uh, attachments, so it could be an embossing, so it's a fold, and it could also be a plotter, so you can put a pen in there, too. And, um, you'd be surprised how interesting the plotter part was. Uh, what was project number one, and what was, yeah. Pro- project one, um, in fact, I think I have a, my first, uh, one here was, uh, cut out, you know, grab the vinyl, grab the vinyl you color you dislike the most, grab a 2D thing and just start cutting and get a sense of depth Mm -hmm. and, you know, and make stickers. Um, I made Mm -hmm. robots and skeletons. uh, And I had a lot of pink, so you made it. um, And 
It, and it was sort of like get everyone comfortable with the machine. There were tons of how-to videos. Silhouette's great, at, or Cameo's great at, at uh, doing some really great how-to videos. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, free artwork. They have already like your your feed set. Feeds and speeds are set by material and depth of knife um, on this model is actually automated. So in the old ones, you had to twist it to get the right depth. This mm -hmm. one actually like, did that, you know, for you. Okay. So um, they got a sense of feeds and speeds and they could really modify that quickly and see the difference of, well, you know, if I go one click deeper or a little slower, I take two passes, they're still learning material and learning process there. Right. Um, or you could cut through the, the backing and you wouldn't quite get a sticker, you'd get a cutout and killing it was really a pain. So there were <laughs> there was sort of this like perfect, you know, sure, sure. you know, thing. So but you know, stickers get, you know, one week of stickers is all you need. Um yeah. and you know, I was like, oh let's like make stencils and spray paint, let's do you know, like all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, but they, you know, they, they kind of outgrew stickers with, you know, as they should have in, in very quickly. And then we started getting into making, uh, I don't know if you would call it Pepecura or it's not quite origami. It's not quite, you know, uh, but it, it's, uh, 3d forms out of 2d, uh, um, drawings and, and okay. material. And I found a great resource called templatemaker.nl, I believe. Um, let me double check that template. Yeah, templatemaker.nl. And that is this incredible site for the laser cutter and a vinyl cutter to get uh, get the, these geometric uh, volumes out of flat 2D uh, paper. And yeah. they're great. Uh, so I highly recommend it. So I'm, I'm again, standing on the shoulders of people. Yeah, I've seen a couple of these. This one actually looks. This feels like way more robust than any of the, any of the other um, right. of these seen, templates. Yeah, that like, I've... yeah. Like you've seen the box maker and the gear generator and all, all yep. of that. Um, this this is like a step up in my opinion of, of just and it was so easy to use and cool. Yeah. So you're cutting cardboard cutting. at this point. I was uh, cutting cereal boxes. Uh, so nice. again, okay. material is is really hard to find. Um, and then, then, you, then it became this exploration of material, what material worked the best and what didn't. And my students are, you know, they, they might be living in New York for the two years and then they're gone. So they, they don't have a closet full of craft supplies or, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, probably anything. So they're ripping off the cover of a sketchbook and like cutting, you know, I'm cutting up my Rice Krispie box and, you know, sure. Um, and suddenly it became what material that was easy to get worked the best. Mm -hmm. And I found personally, there were these nice glossy brochure junk mail things that I was getting that just cut beautifully and had <laughs> held their line. So like, <laughs> I ended up like, saving everything. Um, the and tolerance cards, on these glossy, they were great. They're great. Throwaway thingies um, is perfect. <laughs> the, 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 the best one, this is really funny. Um, cause the other thing we did in, um, just to segue a little bit, the other thing we did in the class was we relied on online fabrication vendors. So mm -hmm. we sent something out to Sh Shapeyoko or Pinoco, not Shapeyoko, Shapeways, Shapeways Pinoco, yeah. or uh, I found Send Cut Send. It's a metal laser cutting service. Okay. Their brochure, vinyl cuts, amazing. Uh, so <laughs> I got I got some, uh, some aluminum parts lasered and it came with all of their, you know, their PR stuff and the stuff cut great in the vinyl cutter. So, so I don't know if Send Cut Send knows that or not, but they, they work <laughs> out. Um, so it was this nice, happy accident. And what are you, to like pull back a little bit, what are you trying to teach students at this point in the class? Like what is the lesson? Um, they're making these things, but what are yeah. they learning? Uh, well, the, the lesson was a big pivot. So what was supposed to be you learn many machines you learn the process at least you've gone through it a few times on, on these types of machines and then how they can kind of become just part of your toolbox right you know i start on the lathe and then i go to the four axis and then maybe i finish up on the lathe again or whatever mm -hmm. um or maybe i make jigs on the cnc to make my hand routing better whatever that ends up being that's out the window 
And the pivot was basically we'd get anything we put in their hands because they're, they're, again, the students didn't have tools because they have a shop, they have access to a shop normally, and they don't have material because it's all at school. And um, so they had, we all became MacGyver and, you know, like whatever your material, that's what you're using. Here's a vinyl cutter, but if you have anything else you'd like to use, you can use it. Um, I even allowed uh, 3D printers in my subtraction class. So this was the first, you know, like it was a, um, whatever fabrication uh, pursuit that any student was interested in was sort of okay. But for the most part, it was kind of, uh, it was, a, it was a, you know, I'm going to class half full of it here. Um, it was a nice design constraint. Um, there was a great project that came out of being stuck in their apartment, only having a vinyl cutter. And that was basically it. I mean, and, I feel but, like we've both been in like, uh, workshops or classes or seminars or something where there is like that is the the design premise, right? Is yeah. you have a pen and paper and we know yeah. that you can all do amazing things with fancy tools, but like, yeah. this is what you have. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that's, I don't, I don't know that I would even, I mean, I hear you that it's sort of glass half full, but, but also yeah. like, um, while it is not what these people have signed up for. to Exactly. To and, yeah. So there, there was probably, I mean, they, they didn't complain at all, which was great. I would have probably complained a little bit uh, if I were them. Uh, but they, you know, they were, I think it was a week of like, oh, what's going to happen? This isn't it. This isn't what I wanted. And then I think everyone realized this isn't what anyone wants. And so, it, you know, no one has it worse than anyone else. Well, there are people who have it much worse. But, you know, as far as, um, you know, not, not getting the actual access that they wanted um right right, right. and so yeah and you know some people just like were all in then like there were a few students who made a daily practice of i'm vinyl cutting something every morning every day um mm -hmm. trying different materials and trying the same image or the same file but in different ways and like different knives different whatever and um and some people some students really worked on their 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 process right like they um they found a cad package that we weren't teaching like a lot of people fell in love with grasshopper in rhino and mm -hmm. you know and i don't usually teach that so like hey if you want to do it go for it and they became like this like almost like a a research assignment for themselves to to learn another cad which there's never time to do normally yeah. and and then they had like a, a really informed opinion it wasn't just well, I know this CAD, so I use it. It was, well, this is good for this, and this is good for this, and there must be something else out there that's good for something else. Um, but my favorite uh, thing that came out of it was this process that one student did. Um, she wanted to make uh, 3D sculptural uh, paper fold and cut. Uh, so not quite origami, but kind of origami-ish, and had no idea where to start. Um, she tried plugins and grasshoppers trial and stuff and couldn't find anything that she liked. And she just started taking existing uh, origami PDFs and tweaking them a little bit. Took a PDF into Illustrator, made it a DXF, took it into the vinyl cutting silhouette software, cut it, folded it, photographed it, brought that into Photoshop, and then did all these color renderings on it and made these giant poster size graphic prints that had shading and color saturation that were crazy and, and you know the process part, was bananas part like actual model part photorealistic yeah. like post-processing right cool. and so it had this kind of 50s 60s uh vacation poster pastel kind of okay. quality and it had this crisp uh but the shadows were awesome and and, but like the papers were, you know, the paper cuts were like this big, but the posters I could envision would be giant. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, and they didn't, they were so far removed from, uh, what would have normally come out of class. Like a 2d graphic would never mm -hmm. have come out of my subtraction mm -hmm. class. And even though this woman had, uh, uh, a lot of, um, graphic design background, it was this process that she would have never have done. And, um, and she made like a little photo studio and it all was on her iPhone. Like it was this great, I have no tools except for these tools. 
So I'm going to use these tools. And, um, and it was kind of these, those are the things I want to bottle and mm -hmm. see what can happen when you just sure. like, live with a tool long enough um, that it becomes your process. Uh, or what was, so what was the, like, uh, I guess even to give, just get a little bit more concrete, um, your, I, I assume that you sort of ended with a, a final of some, some kind, but like, what was the actual, like, second to last lesson where you were like, I'm going to teach you this today on the vinyl cutter. What were, what were those sorts of lessons like? So it, I tried to get as, uh, it, so I tried to incorporate, uh, I, it, I relied a lot on previous work I had done. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went to every vinyl cut project I've ever done. And the first one that I did that was of significance was for an artist by the name of Tony Dove. And she made this animatronic, uh, she calls it a dress, but it is a robot uh, with a big hoop skirt. And, um, uh, and it was these pyramids, these, like, uh, these, you know, and she wanted to 3D print them or laser cut. You know, I, everyone tries to laser cut geodesic domes in these, these forms, and they never quite come together. And I, I made these pyramids out of, out of vinyl and a vinyl cutter, and they held great. It just, you know, they were perfect. And they were lit and they were great for diffusing. And it was such a simple, oh, we made a grid of them. So like, it was like, if you like moved one, they all kind of moved. And, Where can we um, see a picture of this? Uh, I know it's on my site. I'm sure Tony Dove, uh, so if, uh, if you go to uh, belightdesign.com, there's a fabrication uh, link and it is called The Dress That Eats Souls. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so that is, uh, so I had nothing to do with most of it except for the pyramids. And, um, if you scroll down, you'll just see it's a really simple matrix of these, these, uh, these pyramids that had a lot of life in them, had a lot of movement, a lot of kinetic. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was like these little changes meant a lot, like how you snap these rivets together, how, you know, you had to have a place to put your finger inside the, the pyramid and you had to, you know, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And so I showed them that we start making 3d forms. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the students is a lighting designer. So he comes up with, uh, he uses di dichroic film and, and Fresnel lenses. So he mm -hmm. was cutting those. He went through like five blades cutting these lenses and he was bending these really interesting geometries, but then putting, LEDs under them and the light was bending like crazy. So everyone wants to do that now. And, yeah. um, and then, you know, I'm trying to bring it back to what, what I know. And I made these little robot toys. Uh, one of them is, looks like one is Spider-Man. And, uh, I started cutting Spider-Man eyes out of uh, the vinyl. And, you know, I, I did a lot of milling on the, on the Bantam, a lot of powder coating on these metal tin, uh, can toys, but the eyes were like, it's like, the thing and um and I, I have literally an envelope of of spider-man eyes here uh so you know of every you know name your favorite spider-man you know is it uh you know the old electric company or you know like and, uh, so every color every angle every like slight tweak and i could test it in this toy this head of spider-man and you know, I'm the only one that cares, but there's like a slight difference or his one eye is a little bit, you know, or, you know, like the one with eyeballs, like what, you know, like that kind of, <laughs> um, so, and it was so easy to iterate with the vinyl cutter that it became, it wasn't a vinyl cut project. It was how I get the, the project I want done, but also kind of like able to play around with it easily. Mm -hmm. And they just became these inserts inside of, of a toy. And, you know, and they're just vinyl on the back of a milk carton because, again, material is not around. You have to work with, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, again, it was just showing them uh, both the, it could be the project or it could just be the small insert or, you know, mm -hmm. it might, maybe it's just a, a spray mask for spray painting. You know, whatever it is, it should be incorporated into your, your work because it's not this, like, you're not going to, it, chances are it's not the only tool you'll be using in something. Um, but uh, right. 
but but people really the students did a real deep dive at the end that there was a lot of origami and there were a lot of those um i'm forgetting the the term but the animations when you move the bars and they like the fish look like they're swimming i'm forgetting oh, what that's called that like a moray it, it, there were more patterns too, it, but it's sort of this uh, bar animation that, you know, every other, you get like three frames of animation. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I should have done my homework, but, uh, uh, but it, it was really fascinating that there was a lot you could get out of this flat, you know, material. Um, yeah. It, yeah. So back to so, basics. Yeah. And, and it worked out a lot better than, than I had hoped, uh, um, so it, it, it was surprising. And, and then the other thing is it's a machine, right? Like there, there are these motors and belts and they're, they can see on a simple, uh, a much simpler scale, how these machines work and mm -hmm. that, oh, it's a timing belt, just like it is in the laser cutter. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a little servo, or I actually don't think it is a servo, but, uh, what's bringing the knife down and, you know, X, Y, Z still exists, even though mm -hmm. it's very different, right? It's a, mm -hmm. you know, X of 12 inches and a Y of infinity or whatever your, your map board is, mm -hmm. but your, your Y or your Z is like a fraction of an inch of a knife. Um, right. And for CNC building or even thinking about get like building your own tool for your own specific, uh, you know, project, it's possible. And, you know, yeah. for, 300 bucks or whatever this machine costs, you know, you could tear it apart and just use it for spare parts on, on the machine. Um, so, they, and that's, if they break, that's what they were going to be. So we're like, Oh, we got belts and axles and, you know, now we're learning about the interior of a yeah. servo motor. Yep, I was ready to take, about. yeah, I was ready to take a <laughs> screwdriver to it. If, if one of them broke, it was like, all right, we we're documenting the guts. And so it was like the, um, you know, you use every part of the animal, you know, like I was ready to, you know, everything. So, um, and Ben, is there a place that we can share either now or, or later and follow up where there's a collection of these projects is that did ITP document? Yeah. So, um, I'm a stickler for documentation. So I make all of my students, uh, document, um, okay. and all, all of our classes or all of my classes live under itp.nyu.edu slash FAB for fabrication and, uh, itp.nyu dot edu slash slash fab fab and then you'll see subtraction is where uh this class uh, ended up and there's some class work on one of the links um cool. the last link there and uh yeah that's it i i am a stickler for you are your documentation especially now um teaching remotely is hard debugging a project remotely is close to impossible um, and, uh, you know, if someone holds a breadboard up to the screen, like, Hey, does this look right? And then puts their board down. It's like impossible. Um, mm -hmm. so I was really on them to document even just so that I could help them. But, um, you know, sad if, if your stuff isn't on the internet, it doesn't exist, unfortunately, but, um, I, I really get on them to, to post, but documentation was huge this year, um, to just be able to teach. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, class work, uh, spring 2020. That's, that's them. Yeah. That's, that's okay. That's, cool. That's I'm going to drop this into chat for everyone right. here. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you for yeah. sharing this stuff. And yeah, uh, absolutely. If, uh, and yeah, so you're, you're in the process now, I assume of gearing up for round two of round two, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, yeah, um, I, and you know, what's, what's really unfortunate, uh, we just moved our facility and we just built this this brand new uh, DigiFab space. We had more space than we ever had. We were teaching in the, like right next to the machines and we had, you know, this great access in the room and then this happened. Um, so it, it's, it was unfortunate, it was too bad um, and if it, continues or lingers a little bit longer you know we're we're preparing for that we're hoping for the best but preparing for many scenarios and hopefully hopefully they will be uh not so uh dire but um yeah you know um i think it's the new normal too i i think we're going to be always having some part of is remote whether it's 
the faculty or a student or all students or mm -hmm. you know um it's tough to do hands-on projects that way but i mean yep. pro programming classes are great you know and yep. um you know i'm sure there are a ton of uh, uh subjects that are, are really perfect for this kind of learning so it's going to be it should be considered you know like okay. remote learning i think is going to be with us for a while uh, or at least that's what i've convinced myself um mm -hmm. and uh i think we should all be figuring out better ways to do that and um yeah uh i will say i'm very jealous of uh people that teach this to students that have garages or backyards or just workspaces where a lot of my students are you know brooklynites you know multiple roommates um, and you know lucky they have a coffee table kind of situation so you are just having space like that like everyone was like oh you need internet to do this like yeah but you also need a space to work and um i think that was the thing everyone learned the hard way that didn't have it that space and privacy to work is is just as crucial so yeah, yeah. Well, uh, good luck. Thank you. And, Thank you. Um, can you show Can you show us your clock one last time before we, we absolutely and, absolutely and, and go out the uh, so, fifty five or one hour and five minute? That's it. Um, so the time is irrelevant. These so days. right now these are vinyl cut a uh, little uh, deal. Uh, the plan is uh, I, I cut out some brass to make a really nice uh, clock face, but it will cover up all of this. So. Um, I kind of wanted to show how it works first uh, yeah. before I went and did that. Um, After all this vinyl cutter talk, I feel like you have to have some vinyl yeah. cut feature on here. Well, There's well a sticker it, on the back, maybe a robot sticker on the back. You know what? I forgot there. I found a process or just learned of a process called uh, electrochemical etching. Um, oh, yeah. You just vinyl cut over some metal, and then with a 9 volt battery, you can remove it. It's a whole thing. It's, uh, it's going to be great. So. When you teach that class, let me know. I okay, that, one. uh, I, that one's going to be fun. So I'm going to experiment <laughs> with that in the brass uh, this weekend, maybe. <laughs> cool. Well, Ben, always good to, to chat with you. Great and seeing you. Thanks so much for sharing this stuff. My pleasure.